Duke fans, hey there, and welcome to the 150th episode of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. That's right, 150 episodes. Can you believe that? That is amazing stuff. Uh, We are recording this on Sunday, February 24th, and we're going to recap an up and down week for the Blue Devils. We'll discuss the injury to Zion Williamson and preview the games this week against Virginia Tech and Miami. We'll also get into a little bit of history the podcast is going to make next weekend. First off, let's thank our sponsors. Uh, first, those guys at Bird Campbell, PA, a business law firm with offices in Florida and Texas, founded by two Duke graduates who bleed Duke blue. Bird Campbell needs business. This podcast is also brought to you by GTHC, GTH.com, which we all know means go to hell, Carolina, go to hell. Get all your hats, your t shirts, your phone fingers, and other apparel from that website that shows your hate for all things Carolina, all orders. Through the final four are 20% off with the promo code DBR, and that is at gthcgth.com. Uh, it's Donald here, your host for the week, broadcasting from my normal spot here in Washington, D.C. I'll bring in my co host as well. First off in Durham, North Carolina, Sam Klein. Sam, what's up? Uh, so I was at the game on uh, Wednesday against North Carolina, and I and and as a result, I had a couple brushes of celebrity that I wanted to share with you. Uh, the first was that I... Uh, got to shake hands with President Obama uh, when he walked by the student section, which was extremely cool. Uh, and then after the game, we got a Twitter tag from uh, ESPN college basketball analyst. And he said, I think he's still at ESPN and former college basketball coach, Fran Frischilla, noting that he listens to the podcast. So hi, coach. Uh, and that he was upset that I called out Dino Gaudio uh, for being the downfall of Wake Forest basketball, because apparently I forgot that Dino Gaudio was OK as the Wake Forest basketball coach. <laughs> so so my apologies first and foremost to uh to to the former coach Gaudio and uh hello to Fran Fraschilla. Hey Fran, uh thank you for listening. Uh that's awesome Sam. It was it was really cool to see uh that on Twitter. Also, uh you are the second person on this podcast to shake the hand of the former president as well. I was able to do it um back in 2007 at his very first campaign um when I volunteered for him. So uh, Jason, I think you're, you gotta be number three. We have to make round this out. Jason in Atlanta, I bring you in. Hey, Jason. I have not shake the hand of Barack Obama. I have shake the hand of several other former presidents. In fact, I, I spent an entire weekend hanging out ago for a television documentary that I produced on him for CNN. So, uh, I got that going for me in the words of, che- uh, sorry, Bill Murray in Caddyshack. Uh, Which real is nice. quick. Yeah, real quick, um, <laughs> to, to make this a nonpartisan bot- broadcast. Um, in 2004, my senior year, uh, we had the UNC game, my final game in Cameron as a student. And the current president, uh, Donald Trump, was there. And the entire student section led a chant of Our Donald's Better as they pointed at me. And he was looking at me. I'm about <laughs> 15 awesome. feet from him. And I'm just shaking my head as if to say, Sorry, bro, you're in my house, <laughs> which is probably the easily the, the best moment in Cameron in my lifetime. So thank you to all the camera crazies who were around for that little uh, serenade. Uh, it, it meant a lot to me, even though it was a very little part of the game. Um, but you know what, guys? We have basketball to cover. Let's get into it. We had two games this week. We're going to discuss the Syracuse game later, a 75-65 victory for Duke. But first off, we start with the Carolina game. Blue Devils faced them in Cameron on Wednesday night. The final score is not one we really want to talk about. 88 to 72 UNC. Uh, The game and everything around the game kind of has been overshadowed by what happened about 27 seconds into the game. For all of you out there who did not see it, Zion Williamson trying to stop on a dime on the first possession of the game, literally blows through his shoe, hurting his right knee in the process. He leaves the game, does not return. And it felt like it really took the sales out of the team and all of Cameron uh, since the game. You think? Zion, you think? You know, yeah, a little bit. Um, since the game, Zion has been diagnosed with a grade one mild knee sprain. He's considered day to day. But in a game that had so much hype, everyone from Spike Lee to Sam mentioned uh, the former president, Barack Obama, was in the building. Oh, I also oh. saw Spike Lee. I sent you guys a picture of Spike Lee. Yes, he, you did. You did. Yeah, uh, I had a, I had a prime a nod. I had a prime seat at this game. I asked I asked Spike Lee repeatedly if he was tanking for Zion uh, and he would not, he would not answer in the affirmative. 
Well, I mean, he was he's, wearing Knicks gear. He was all in the Knicks gear. Yeah, yeah. he's all in. Um, he, uh, I don't think they've hired him yet, but that wouldn't be beyond the Knicks to hire Spike Lee uh, to represent them. Um, but with with all this hype on this game, all the talk about ticket prices and just all the eyeballs, it is you know one of the most watched basketball games ever. Um, that really took the, the hype really left the building when Zion left the game and UNC. I hate to say it. They played some good basketball and took the game away from Blue Devils. So, Sam, I want to start you with you first because you were in Cameron. What was the mood like there when Zion went down, and what was the rest of the game like from your vantage point? Honestly, it was pretty weird. So, as anybody who's ever been to the Duke UNC game knows, especially if you've ever been in the student section, such that you have to wait in line for days or weeks to be in there, and and the, you know, there's just a lot of there's a lot of buildup for the game. So everybody's inside. They're all packed in. They're all ready to go. And, you know, they do the intros. Like, it, it, the stadium is, as they say, like at full tilt. And Donald, as you said, 30 seconds into the game, Zion goes down. He comes off the court. No one really knows what the problem is, but he doesn't reappear. So very quickly realize that Duke is going to have to change the game plan. This is now the second game this season where Duke has lost a starter in the first couple minutes of the game and had to adjust on the fly. And both times now first against Syracuse when Trey Jones went down and now against UNC without Zion Duke has, has sort of failed to, um, to adjust to a, a level that allows them to beat their opponent and UNC as I think a lot of folks know is, is better than Syracuse is. So already Duke is, is in a hole despite having guys like RJ Barrett still on the team and, Barrett ended up having to play the full 40, um, took a lot of shots. It did end up with 33 points on the night, but really UNC just didn't have, um, didn't have to cover as much ground on defense because uh, there wasn't a lot of offensive quality coming from the Blue Devils. Trey Jones was one for 11 from the field. I think, I think his inability to hit shots was a, was a big factor here. And then the other one, of course, being, uh, the lack of Zion Williamson on defense, Luke May was able to take advantage of uh, less capable defenders for the Blue Devils and get a lot of easy baskets going at the rim. I think that's a thing that Duke didn't realize was that, that you know, Javin Delorier and Marquise Bolden weren't primarily there to stop him. Um, Zion Williamson should have been doing that. And without him, it was a big challenge for uh, for Duke to contain. I did like in the second half how much Duke kept fighting, right? right down to the to the final 45 seconds or so of the game it never felt like they gave up on this game um and in particular in the second half they started to adjust on defense to putting pressure on UNC and and forcing them to cough up the ball a little more uh that part was good it just was a little bit too it was too little too late for duke as as UNC was um making shots pretty efficiently and able to get the ball in the right guy's hands. Luke May, of course, as I mentioned, already had a great game. Um, Duke was able to to kind of cut off Kobe White a lot uh, on offense, which I said was going to be key to the game. But unfortunately, the rest of the um, UNC team sort of sort of took over from there. Cam Johnson also had a spectacular night for Carolina. So I I don't think that this means that Duke is in some kind of trouble, you know, going forward. Um, they certainly had a, a a very good bounce back game against Syracuse last night with again without Zion and with the time to prepare for such a game. It also sounds like he he should be back in the next week or two, which will be really helpful. I'm much more curious to see how Duke does again against Carolina in Chapel Hill uh, in a couple of weeks with Zion back because that's going to be a big indicator uh, going into the into the end of the regular season and and into the postseason about exactly how good they can be and then. The other lesson that we've now learned twice is that Duke really can't have players, key players coming out of the game uh, and, and missing entire games because, you know, the the three or four most important guys in this team are so essential to making the thing work correctly. And, and you remove R.J. Barrett, you remove Zion Williamson, you remove Trey Jones, any of those guys comes uh, off the court for the whole game, and it's it's a totally different team. Hey, Jason, you know, I, I, I want to get your take on it, but I, I kind of want to bring it in with the question that obviously centered around Zion's exit from the game. You know, we were outscored in the paint, 62 to 28. We were outscored in points off of turnovers. We were outscored in second chance points. We were outscored off the break. Uh, all these things probably would have gone 
the other way, or at least been closer, especially in the in the terms of points in the paint. If we had Zion in the game, how big of a of a, of a missing piece was he against UNC, and and why do you think we couldn't recover from that? I, I think a lot of it was shock. Um, you know, anytime you see a guy, look, if a guy gets, um, you know, if they bang their head, if they get poked in the eye, if they hurt an arm or something like that, or a hand, you don't think about it as much as a knee. You, you, you see your buddy, you see a guy who, you know, you've gone to war with every game this season, um, and the best player in the country, you know, and we're not going to get into the, the superlatives, but one of the greatest freshmen in NCAA history you see that guy go down with something having to do with his knee. And it's, it's a weird thing. You know, the shoe explodes. Like it, it's like the stuff of legend. Yeah, well, it's like um, once in a lifetime thing. Like when you, I mean, you see it's shoes crazy. kind of bust, but like the way that it busted, it literally like the one time it was supposed to keep him on the, you know, upright. It failed at that particular moment. And you did know, you guys, did you guys see uh Puma's tweet about it during the game? Oh yeah. 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 And they yeah. deleted it very quickly when they saw that they were not getting the the uh, response that they thought they would. Um, Look, I respected I respected it. Uh, power yeah. to Puma. I was saying to friends all week that I would love to be in the R and D divisions at all the shoe companies this week, trying to you know finalize their pitch to Zion Williamson now that perhaps his services are are more open as he uh, as he picks a shoe deal. You know, coming into it coming into his professional career. But, I mean, yo, yo, yo. we're, we're going to talk about the shoe deals a little later. I, I got yeah. a, I got some comments about that. Yeah. Uh, but back to the, the question about the game, I, I think our guys, you look, they tried to battle through it. Um, they tried to find themselves, but, but it's really difficult to uh, on the fly. And, and with that kind of shock and that much energy, I mean, you can't discount the fact that it's the Carolina game. It's at home. You know, these guys have been doing nothing but thinking about this, you know, at least for 48 hours, probably much, much longer than that. And then, like, it happens, and, and almost instantly Carolina busts out, and they're doing nothing but shooting layups all game, and you're struggling, and, and it's, like, it's like a whirlwind happening around you. Um, I, I'm, I'm not surprised we, we lost by 16 points. It frankly could have been 30, um, and I wouldn't have been that shocked. Uh, I, I, I just think it's so hard to recover from an event like that happening um, to, to, to put it aside and be able to focus yourself back on the game. And, and in the game, I mean, you know, you mentioned it, the 62 points in the paint, uh, I, I vaguely recall, I haven't looked it up and verified it, are the most that Duke has ever in their history given up in the paint. Um, again, I haven't been able to verify that fact, but I, I can't even begin to imagine that that that's not the case. Carolina was terrible from three point range. They were two of 20 from three, but they were 36 of 55 from two. That's 65%, better than 65%. They continually got into the lane and got easy shots from five feet, three feet, or right underneath the basket, like constantly. You cannot tell me that a guy the size of Zion Williamson a shot blocker like Zion Williamson would not have changed that. Um, and, and then for Duke, so other than Cam and RJ, um, who, who played fairly well, um, they, they, they were scoring for us. Other than Cam and RJ, this, this game showed you, you need something else. So Javin Delorier had three, they were like, you know, fast break. He had three dunks, you know, three easy shots that Javin hit. Not, not to knock him, that's great. You know, I'm, I'm happy for you. The rest of the team, all the other guys in the team, other than Javin going three for three and Cam and RJ, the rest of the supporting cast was one for 24. One for 24? That's like 4%. That's like shoot it blindfold kind of numbers. If you had stuck a blindfold on Trey Jones and said, hey, dude, you're somewhere on the basketball court. Yeah, you're close to the lane now. T take some shots. He hits better than the number of shots he hit. I, it's just uh, Jack White couldn't hit anything. At wide open three-pointers. Jordan Goldwire, Alex O'Connell. It was just one after another. No one could do anything. Marquise Bolden, who played so well lately, plays almost 20 minutes, gets two rebounds and no points. He takes one shot. 
Um, a, a, a lot of it was the shock of Zion. And a lot of it was just, you know, it's like we didn't come to play. I, I think that when Zion went down, uh, we just went into a shell. And and we're we're lucky that it wasn't worse than it was. Not that, I mean, look, how much does the margin really matter? You lost by 16. You lost by 20. You lost by 12. These are all margins that are unacceptable for a team that's this good. But I think they've got, if there's ever an excuse, they've got the excuse. And, and let me ask you guys one question, then I'll go. Uh, I, I said this to you all that I was going to ask you this. I think this is the worst regular season game in Duke history. Uh, and not not in terms of the result of the game, but when you combine the result of the game, the expectations of the team, the opponent, North Carolina, the fact that it's at home, and the fact that you know one of the greatest players in Duke history, the greatest freshman in Duke history, goes out a minute into the game because his shoe exploded. <laughs> like, nothing else, nothing could go worse than that. I think it's the worst game in Duke history. Do y'all, do y'all agree? I don't have a, as long a memory as you do, but when you combine all of those factors, it it certainly makes sense, right? I remember some bad Duke regular season games. You know, I think back to uh, Clemson in 2009, Georgetown in 2010, uh, those types of games, but they're on the road against tough opponents. Like, it, it, it stinks to get blown out, but, but it happens. Um, this was getting blown out at home in a game where Duke was favored and... And the injury just just sort of tops it. I think you're right, Jason. I mean, and the hyperbole. rival, the rival, Carolina. Yeah, right. The the whole the whole thing. Uh, it's sort of the opposite of the of the 2010 home game against UNC, right? Yeah, unquestionably. Uh, it, it's uh, and the expectations. I mean, yeah, we all heard about it. Can you imagine being one of these people that paid four grand, five grand, ten grand for a seat? There are people out there who paid $10,000 to get into this game and 30 seconds in the game, Zion Williamson's gone. And frankly, five, 10 minutes into the game, it was clear that Carolina was going to beat Duke's asses. Look, I, I mean, paid, I paid tuition at, at Fuqua this year to go to this game. <laughs> Let's not. <laughs> That's a lot of money. <laughs> look, woe is me. All right. The, 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 it's a, it was a lot of money to be here. Yeah. Uh, for me, I don't think it was the worst regular season loss ever. And the reason why is because it is Carolina. You guys say it is because it's Carolina. I say it isn't because it's Carolina. Because in this rivalry, I expect, a, you know, games to, could end like this. You know, whether it, it could also have ended, you know, with us beating them by 40 points. This wasn't 8-20 and 20 Carolina. This was a number eight ranked team in Carolina. We we got blown out, yes. But it wasn't like we, at that Clemson game that you that you brought up, Sam, in 2009, where, where we were we lost by like 27 points. Yeah, it was on the road, but that was to Clemson. That wasn't to the eighth, eight ranked team in the country. That was to a Clemson team that I, if I recall correctly, did not make the tournament. It had no business being in the same gym as, as that team. Um, so there have been bigger losses, but when you combine everything, yeah, this is a really big hurt because, you know, we learned just like we learned against Syracuse back in January, we learned how integral to the defense that Trey Jones is. We learned how integral to not just Duke basketball, but college basketball, Zion Williams, what Zion Williamson is. And, and I think that right there is why people are kind of elevating this because of how great a player that he has been and really the freakness of how this turned about. It, it really, no one, it, yeah, you can expect someone to get injured. You can say, hey, it's possible, but no one thinks he's going to blow through his shoe. 30 seconds into the game. And honestly, like, look, if you look at this, his, his points per game went down two points because of this. He, he had to log, they had to log him as played a minute in this game where if it, it, you know, that's not something that you expect. And I think that took everything out of everyone in that gym, um, except for those guys wearing Carolina blue. Actually, uh, uh, Hey, uh, how amazing did you guys notice the amount of coverage that Zion and his shoe got in the wake of this game. Oh, I was yeah. Watching, I was watching ESPN the next morning, and look, the NBA was on all-star break. No offense to hockey fans. No one really pays much attention to hockey. It was hockey on a break or something. I don't know. But I watched No, hockey ESPN. was playing. Hockey was playing? You mm -hmm. wouldn't know it from watching ESPN the next morning. The next morning on ESPN, there was no other story. I don't say that to be like yeah, – that was. that's not hyperbolic. That's not me you know, exaggerating things. Quite literally – from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., which is when I was 
VPN. I was at work and I had it on, on a screen right next to me. I wasn't listening, but I could see, I could see the font on the screen. The word Zion Williamson was on the screen every single second that ESPN was doing their morning shows the next yeah. week. It Every was everywhere. Single and- second. It was it was the only story. We ran a story on CNN about it. I saw Fox News running stories about Zion Williamson's shoe. Wow. Well, if you if you think about it, I mean, the, they identified the shoes that he was wearing. It was the it was the Paul George PE uh or PG 2.5s. And Paul George himself called Nike and said, Yo, what's up with my shoes? Um, Nike flew a t- flew a team, a representative out to Durham to meet with coach K and Zion about the shoes to kind of put them, you know, reassure them that this is just one of those once in a lifetime generation freak accidents that happened and that they should be, you know, trust, they should trust that the, you know, that this won't ever happen again. Um, so for that, for Nike to go to those lengths, I mean, Nike's stock took a hit on, on Thursday morning because of this, um, all of these, you know, all the stories that came out about this is something that I haven't seen before. Um, yes, it's because it's Zion Williamson, but I mean, I, we've seen shoe, like I said, we've seen shoes break before on the court. We've seen guys have to replace shoes. It was the magnitude of the, the player that was in those shoes and the magnitude of the moment and the game that they were playing. And with all eyes basically in America on this game, that is why that this was blown up to such high proportion. I mean, like I said, it was, they rated it the the biggest ESPN viewed telecast ever uh, for basketball and the third highest ranked basketball game of all time on any network. So that is, that is a lot of eyeballs on this story and that's why it has carried throughout the weekend. Okay guys, we now move on to the Syracuse game uh, that took place Saturday evening at the carrier dome. It was another game where Duke really struggled in the first half, and we were somehow able to turn it around in the second half. As I mentioned earlier, Duke comes out with a 75-65 victory in a game where they did not have Zion Williamson. He sat out with the knee injury. Uh, Before we get into this, I want to shout out my boy Mark Hecker, who texted me when we were down 23 points to Louisville right before the comeback. We obviously came back and won that game. He texted me again at halftime of this game and said, you know, you didn't shout me out. Last time and we won, and this was before we came back in this second half. We obviously came back with a victory. So, uh, Mark, please keep texting me because apparently we are undefeated when this happens. Uh, <laughs> and Jason, for this game, it became the RJ Barrett show. So, let's start with his performance. He had a truly magnificent game, didn't he? Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I mean, with Duke missing Zion and, and needing, you know, someone else to step up, we, we all knew that someone else would probably be RJ Barrett. But I don't think we realized how complete a game he would play. And, you know, I want folks to think back a little bit. Think back a little bit to the player that we saw, like, early in the season, like, against Gonzaga, when everyone was like, this, you know, he's all one-on-one. This guy's myopic. He gets the ball, and he's all shoot, 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 shoot. It's all about me. Um, to the player that that RJ has become, uh, he, he led the team in assists um, against Syracuse. He he repeatedly found his teammates for good situations, and more importantly, he made good situations for himself. That Syracuse zone is is really tough to crack. Uh, you know, it, it, you keep on being tempted to shoot over it. Syracuse is incredibly long and big, and RJ just repeatedly found, you know, the little sliver of space within it. Um, he, when he had to shoot over it, he did, but for the most part, he was able to get into the lane and he finishes so softly, like his ball touches the rim and it instantly goes, Oh wait, I want to go right to that spot that will take me through the net. Um, it, it it's remarkable to watch. I, I'll, I'll tell you, this, I, I feel like RJ, look, RJ is going to be the number two pick in the draft because Zion is some freak from another planet, but but man, does this kid look like he's going to have a heck of a career ahead of him um, because of the way he is able to score so effectively, um, uh, you know, inside and get to the basket. Uh, RJ just had a, a fabulous, fabulous performance. And then, you know, the other guy, we have to talk about Alex O'Connell, don't we? Yeah, we, we talk do. talk about Alex O'Connell uh, on a Duke team that has 
struggled so much from three-point range. I mean, really, look, there's the Kentucky game. There's the Virginia game. Other than that, we've stunk to high heaven from three-point range. And all season, we've been waiting for Alex O'Connell to be one of the guys who maybe, you know, gets a chance to, to, to you know, to start splashing them for us. And he picked a good game to start. Five of eight from three, including a four-point play that that I think – um, yeah, that, that was to me a, a defining play in this game. Um, it, it was a moment where Syracuse was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And I think it's where Syracuse began to wilt a little bit. Um, but O'Connell has 20 points, a career high. He had five rebounds. I thought he did a really nice job on defense as well. Um, I, I thought O'Connell had a, had a, you know, forced into action, had to play 34 minutes, which is a, a ton for him. Um, and guys don't, we got to talk about the rotation, don't we? There's some crazy stuff going on here. So, so, let's, so yeah. let's get into that because I, I want to bring everybody up to speed. You know, normally we have uh, guys like uh, like Jack White uh, play a lot of minutes. Uh, Marquise Bolden plays a lot of minutes. And some in Javin Deloria plays a lot of minutes. Javin Deloria started. He obviously, you know, got a lot of minutes. Uh, our Alex O'Connell also started, um, got 34 minutes. Uh, and that probably led to that confidence probably gave him the boost that he needed to really put on a good game. We didn't see Jack White at all. And on top of that, we saw the season debut of Joey Baker, uh, which means that he no longer has a red shirt. Um, he is, he is now on the books for 2018, 2019. Uh, let's Sam, let me ask you this, like with, with Joey Baker, was that, I know it was a shocking move because we all were kind of texting each other about it, but what do you think this means as far as the rotation? Yeah. I th- this was the thing I wanted to talk about most is the rotation because I made a comment on this show sort of in passing a few weeks ago about how it's like around the beginning of ACC season maybe it was in mid January I said you know take a look at the team now this is what the rotation looks like barring injuries um, Duke and Coach K like as the season goes on to whittle the rotation down not expand it. Uh, it it's it's sort of the way Coach K likes to operate having say six and a half players in rotation. And we thought we knew who those guys were. We don't anymore. Um, Zion Williamson being hurt, obviously, is the biggest wrench in it. But uh, and, and I don't think we got, at least the public didn't get any information about what was going on with Jack White. We know, though, that Jack hasn't been playing well recently on offense. Uh, has really been struggling from three. He hasn't made a three-point shot in, like, over a month. And uh, generally has struggled to, to produce on offense. So uh, it's not surprising, I think, that Coach K wanted to mix things up a lot last night and get different guys minutes. But the Joey Baker thing is really astounding to me because I, you know, it, it's it's hard to predict what Joey Baker is going to look like in four years as a basketball player. Maybe he's going to be so good that he leaves early. Maybe he's a, a super duper member of the team, like a four year guy in the, uh, in the Emil Jefferson mold. We don't know sort of how that's going to play out. What I did think was interesting was even in the times this year when things looked rocky um joey baker didn't take his shooting shirt off and and last night he did and only for a few minutes so i i'm waiting to see what coach k has to say about it i think he has he has a press conference today or tomorrow where he's gonna he's gonna talk about it i'm shocked i'm shocked that it that it that it came out this way i'm also surprised at just how the rotation worked generally we saw delorier and o'connell start last night which i guess maybe we could have predicted but seeing uh, Antonio Vrankovic and Joey Baker be the first guys off the bench and have Marquise Bolden sort of relegated to the end of the rotation was a huge flip for Duke. And I, I don't think we, I, I don't think we know anything about what coach K expects from this team rotation wise going forward, other than that the other three star freshmen are going to keep starting and everybody else is, is really having to earn their minutes. Um, the other thing that that's sort of confusing, troubling to me on the rotation is uh, Trey Jones's offense, um, which which we've talked about being uh, somewhat in decline. He hasn't really been shooting the ball well. He didn't shoot well against uh, against UNC. He didn't really shoot it well against North Carolina or against uh, Syracuse either. He had a bit more success, but um, but it's it's still a challenge for him. And teams are starting to take notice. And he has become um, he, he's become much more uh, of a liability on offense just because because the shot doesn't fall. So teams are able to ignore him. They're able to. Um, kind of give him space and sort of get in his passing lanes as opposed to putting a hand in his face. And that's that's a, a challenge for Duke that they're going to have to overcome. It was a very lucky night that Alex O'Connell decided to be a 20-point scorer 
uh, for the first time because because Duke needed it. And uh, they were obviously down against Syracuse at the half and uh, and managed to pull back away for the victory, but not in a way that I think anybody really anticipated. So the thing I'll say about this is, um, I, first of all, on Joey Baker, I'm absolutely convinced that he has been scorching the nets in practice. There's no way they said let's burn his red shirt if he hasn't five been showing. <laughs> yeah, but if they if if he hasn't been showing in practice that he can really lift this team um, in some significant ways, and I and I can't imagine that's anything but taking three pointers because um, that's where this team needs a lift. We need some outside shooting, um, and, and as you pointed out as we've been discussing ad nauseum for a while jack white hasn't hit a three-pointer since florida state um which feels like it was three seasons ago uh and and i i think coach k was seeing joey baker hit threes in practice and he went you know what this season's too important i'm i'm not going to make 2022 to 23 better at the expense of 2018 to 19 um so you know uh, so he said, Joey, you know, it's your time. You're, you're ready. And, and I, I think we will continue to see Joey Baker in games um, throughout the rest of this, this season. Um, and I, I expect him to be a guy who takes three pointers every single time he is in the game. Cause I think that's his going to be his job. That that's what Jack White's role was until Jack White went into an over 30 or whatever he's at, you know, streak from three. Um, and I think Joey's going to, to some extent, take over that that role. And then the other rotation thing that you mentioned was was the inexplicable lack of play of Marquise Bolden, who we have m- numerous times in this podcast over the past few weeks talked about how much better Bolden was playing. And he really he had a bad game against Carolina, and it was like took one bad game for him to go back to the very very bottom of the bench, which was sort of inexplicable. But then the final six minutes happened, and um. Uh, Javin Delorier picked up his fourth foul. Um, Javin, by the way, had played really good. Um, he wasn't shooting very well. He he couldn't hit a layup to save his life, but he was rebounding really well um, and blocking shots. And and Javin was playing very very well inside in the post, like we needed him to. Um, and Marquise Bolden came in. Do you guys know crazy stat of the game? Marquise Bolden played ten minutes and led Duke in rebounding. In ten minutes, he had eight rebounds. And he was utterly dominant on the boards in the final six minutes. Four offensive rebounds, two defensive rebounds for Marquise in the final six minutes. That's a big number. One of the major reasons Duke was able to hold on at the end and and stretch our lead out a little bit was because when we would take a shot and miss it, Bolden was grabbing the rebound and allowing it to be set. And and Jason, it was rebounds was one of the big concerns against Carolina, where Carolina it seemed like was getting all the rebounds, and then early in this game against Syracuse, um, Duke wasn't able to find an offensive rebound almost ever, and Marquise Bolden turned that around for the Blue Devils. I'm surprised he didn't get more minutes. Yeah, yeah, I, but so I, I just want to I, I want to shout him out. I, I for a guy, it's tough for a guy who look he was playing 30 plus minutes. And now suddenly he was down to 10. And, and remember, he played the final six. He, he had only played four of the first 34 minutes of this game. Um, basically, he and Antonio Frankovic were in the same spot in the rotation. And for Bolden, you know, they gave him another chance. And he really showed he showed he deserves it. He showed, you know, our, our two big men, Delorier and Bolden, combined to grab 15 rebounds. Whew. That's impressive. I'll take that. And they had eight offensive rebounds combined. That's that's the kind of production we need, you know, supporting RJ and, and the rest of the guys. Yeah. The one thing that I noticed about this game, and, and there's a couple things that I want to end with. Uh, the first is with the steals. Um, we're one of the best teams in the country when it comes to steals. We average over 10 a game. Against Syracuse, we had two. And it seemed like a lot of that, uh, I guess, the, the way that we play – feeds a lot off of the fact we get a lot of steals, we get a lot of turnovers and we run the court and, and take it to the other end and, and use that momentum again to hurt the other team. They only had seven turnovers the entire game, which means that we had to just knuckle down and play defense uh, for this, you know, especially in that second half. And I think that was an interesting thing that we've seen. We've seen that when this team is not getting steals and, and not really uh, forcing the issue when it comes to defense, 
that we're, we're struggling in these games and to see a team come back, not by something that is their strength and win a basketball game on the road. I think that speaks a lot to the effort that these guys put in, particularly in the second half. And another thing that I've noticed, and I noticed it against UNC and again against Syracuse, Trey Jones on defense has been terrific. And on offense, it seems like he's been kind of lost in the system and trying to work his way back into it, but he's doing it in a way that seems off. The He's not shooting the ball well. He had 11 points against Syracuse, but a lot of that was from the line. He, he went six for six there. But it seems like he is, the teams are letting him shoot the open three because they know he's not going to make it. And it, it, it he hasn't been on a you know from three pointer in a in a long time, uh, and that's really kind of affecting his offense when he's you know he took twelve shots, and I know that probably ties into the fact that Zion was out and, and the shots got to come from somebody, and he was trying to step up and, and make some plays. Uh, but it seems like he's missing he's he's not just missing three pointers, he's missing you know, 18, 15 footers uh, from the three free throw line. And and that's not like him. I feel like he is pressing a little too much. I don't know if you guys think that, but uh, it's something that is, you know, not necessarily cause for concern, but something that I know the staff is looking at and saying, Hey, if he could just settle down and play the game that has taken him this far in the season, then he'll be more, you know, I feel like he'll be more part of the offense and, and feel more comfortable in it instead of trying to force the issue uh, on times down the court when we can just pass it one more time and find another open man. Hey folks, this edition of the DBR podcast, I want to shout out to one of our sponsors is brought to you by GTHC, GTH.com. That's GTHC, GTH.com. Any good Duke fan knows what that stands for. It's go to hell, Carolina, go to hell. And GTHC, GTH.com is the product of a beloved former Dookie, Kenny Denard. Kenny, by the way, and his partners bought a thousand GTHC, GTH t-shirts that they gave to the students, um, you know, right the, the day before the, this past Carolina game so the students could wear them to the game. They could show Carolina just where Carolina can go. And um, and the back of the shirts, I was talking to Kenny about this. Kenny was at the game. He was absolutely despondent. No one hates UNC like Kenny Denard hates UNC. Let me tell you, I was talking to Kenny and uh, he was he was so upset at the way the game turned out, um, because one of the things he said was the T-shirts that he gave to the students had um, a message written on the back that said, uh, you know, commemorative game. Um, you know, in Cameron, and it had the date and everything like that. And he's like, he says to me, he's like, Jason, he goes, no one's going to want the shirts anymore because it's memories of a game that was a disaster. And I'm like, Kenny, no, no, buddy, you don't understand. That t-shirt is proof, proof that you were at the legendary Zion Williamson shoe game. And he goes, yeah, I guess you're right. So <laughs> in any event, we want to thank GTHC, GTH.com for being a sponsor of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. We want to remind you, I'm sure all of you want to tell Carolina they can go to hell prior to the next Carolina game that's coming up in just a week or so. Two weeks? Yeah, two weeks. Um, and if you go to gthcgth.com on their website, use the promo code DBR, DBR, and you will get 20% off your first order from gthcgth.com. I've spent way too long talking about this, but they're such good guys. They gave t-shirts to all the students and you can get 20 percent off if you go there and you order your gear that all your friends will look at and say what does that mean and it'll allow you to say go to hell carolina go to hell okay guys the blue devils have two games coming up this week first traveling to blacksburg to face virginia tech on tuesday night and then they return home saturday to square off against the miami hurricanes we're going to start with Virginia Tech first and previewing them. Sam, you've taken a look at the Hokies, so tell us what we should expect from them on Tuesday night. Yeah, so Duke takes on Virginia Tech this week. Uh, the Hokies are having a really good season under Buzz Williams, probably one of the best that that he's uh, been a part of since he came over to Blacksburg from Marquette a few years ago. Virginia Tech has been hovering right around that 10 to 15 range in Ken Palm all season, and they're vying for 
one of those top four seeds in the ACC regular season to, to get the double bye. So on top of their usual motivation to beat the good teams when they come into, into Blacksburg, I think you'll see Virginia Tech fired up to potentially earn that that double buy in the ACC tournament, which is valuable. Um, you know, they get that the extra day off, um, a much better shot at winning the ACC uh, conference tournament and then ultimately better seeding in the NCAA tournament. So it'll be a fired up team. I think the key here for Virginia Tech uh, is that their, their starting five all are great shooters from beyond the three-point arc. Um, they're all hitting over 35% from three. They like to shoot the three. So Duke on defense has to be uh, ready to uh, to drive the Hokies off the three-point line, get them inside, force turnovers. Um, the, the defense for Duke, has uh you know when when they know who's on the court um is certainly able to um to to create havoc cam reddish has been playing great on defense the last few weeks i want to see more of that out of him obviously trey jones but um keeping virginia tech off the three-point line is going to be a big deal and where duke is dealing with the uncertainty of of Zion Williamson's injury, Virginia Tech is also missing one of their best players, Justin Robinson. Uh, what their their sort of lead guard? He's a good outside shooter. He's he's a big defender, um, kind of a stocky guy, but he is uh, he, he's he's sort of the engine that drives Virginia Tech. And he's been out the last couple of weeks with a foot injury that we don't have a ton of uh, information about. So perhaps he'll play, perhaps he won't. It is it is sort of analogous to Duke in that regard. Um, so I'm I'm curious to see if he plays. If he doesn't, it's a great sign for Duke. Um, and if he does, it, it's another element that uh, that Duke's going to have to deal with. Um, I, I I really want to see Duke perform well on defense here. And then generally, Virginia Tech plays at a pretty slow tempo, sort of like their compadres down the road in uh, in Charlottesville. So I want to see Duke push the tempo against Virginia Tech, getting to 70, 75 possessions is going to play in Duke's favor in this game. So trying to push the ball, trying to get steals, get out in transition is going to be a boon for Duke and and is going to hurt Virginia Tech, especially uh, at and you know in Blacksburg where the atmosphere is often uh, pretty turned up for for a Duke game. I want to see Duke be able to get some of those easy transition baskets and and sort of silence the crowd and take them out of it, especially if they're still dealing with some of the offensive uh, struggles in the half court that have resulted from uh, from Zion Williamson being out. I think that you remove Duke's highest efficiency offensive player, and there's a lot more uncertainty now about where the points come from from the Blue Devils, you know, perhaps outside of R.J. Barrett. So the other thing I'd add about Justin Robinson is I feel like it has changed the – the Virginia Tech um, offensive attack around to not have him because his ability to to slice into the lane, his, his ability to to create offense both for himself and for other players. I mean, he has a crazy his his assist percentage is like a huge number. Um, it, you know, not just in terms of the total number of assists he gets, but his ability to create for other players is really special. And without Justin Robinson, this this Virginia Tech team that plays a slow pace is really struggling to score. They, they had one nice game uh, against Georgia Tech where they got to 76 points, and, and Tech's a very good defensive team. That's probably, since Justin Robinson got hurt, that's probably their best win is that win over Georgia Tech that they had. Um, but their, their other games, other than that one game, they, they've not been able to score more than 70 points in any of those games. Even with them playing slowly, even with Zion out, um, you know, it's kind of hard to see Duke struggling to get to 70. And yet this is a Virginia Tech team that that without Justin Robinson struggles to get to 70. If he's not around, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It makes things really, really tough for them. They just aren't as varied on offense in terms of what they're able to do. And then the other thing I want to mention about them is they're, they're sort of unique in that they always play small. Like they don't have big guys. Virginia Tech just is not a tall team. Um, other than Kerry Blackshear, um, who's six ten, they they don't put anybody out there who's taller than six six, and and they really it's really four guards surrounding Kerry Blackshear. That's the way they play, uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether Duke you know does does Duke go kind of big against them. If we had Zion, we would automatically be going big against them, and I don't know who they would have who would guard Zion. I guess they'd probably try to have Blackshear maybe do it. 
Maybe they have Ty Outlaw do it. I, I don't know, but it, they, it would be a real, real struggle for them. Um, but but even without Zion there to play, I, I, you know, one of the places where I feel like Duke could have an advantage is is with our bigs and and you know being able to to hit the boards hard against Virginia Tech. Um, although the Virginia Tech guards do a good job of rebounding for guards. So anyway, um, but it, it, it's it's going to be a it, it's. It's not as tough as the Carolina game, but it's certainly the second toughest game we have left on the schedule. Uh, Sam, you mentioned it, you know, when we were talking, you were talking about their three point percentage, they shoot very well uh, from three. If we can limit that, the one thing that I'm looking for, and Jason, you kind of alluded to it um, by talking about the size of their lineup is rebounding. If we can rebound, we should be able to out rebound them any night of the week. And taking that and going out in the, on the break and, and forcing the issue, increasing the tempo is going to give us a lot more opportunities to, to score and make points. Uh, so I, I think that's really the key here. You know, because of the of the size difference, even if we don't have Zion in the game, we should be we are much better at rebounding. We're much better at on the break. And really, we are a much better basketball team if we can put those things together, if we can just knuckle down on defense get one, you know, one and out. If they're going to miss the shot, don't give them an opportunity to get a second chance point because that is going to be what gives them momentum, especially in front of that crowd who is itching to beat us. Um, and, and they do every time we go up there. So uh, that's going to be the key to this basketball game, in my opinion. Get the rebounds, get on the court, or get down the court and, and make it so that we are forcing the issue and Virginia Tech is on their back yet. And now for the Miami preview, but before we get into it, we have a little bit of news to announce. Uh, I alluded to it at the top of the show this Saturday at the Miami game, the DBR podcast crew. Guys, we are going to make a little bit of history for the first time in this podcast history. All three of us will be in the same building at the same time as we all will be in Durham to take in the Miami game, which I personally cannot wait to do. It's going to be awesome. But for all of you that is in town for the Miami game, this means that if you are here, you will have the chance to meet all three of us. Uh, after the game, uh, I think the three of us are going to go to the JB Duke Hotel Bar um, and, and kind of recap the game and just kind of hang out and meet people. So come by and say hello. If you're in the area, we'd love to meet you. And hopefully we're celebrating a Duke victory together. But guys, I can't wait for us to be in the same building at the same time. Uh, this is something that is obviously been a long time coming we've we've almost had it a couple of times but uh now that we're going to have all three of us is going to be awesome yeah and, and i and want i i want folks to to note we had talked in the beginning of the season about doing a live show and we got some uh some good traction from that which i think we wanted to do for this weekend but it the the three of us didn't really firm up these plans until only a few days ago and we just haven't been able to to get the whole thing put together so don't worry we're still thinking about doing it it's just not going to be for this game i'm i'm going to do a better job next season of laying the groundwork for that early um it is it's also final exams right now or this week at, at school so i'm uh, a little in over my head uh in terms of work um otherwise otherwise we'd be doing that but yeah definitely uh definitely come by the jb after the game well, and, and I'll say this, what I will do is I will pull out my iPhone and I will record a little bit of us chatting immediately following the game, um, perhaps perhaps chatting with some of the, you know, the fans who come by and, and talk and, and we'll on the next podcast, we will we will make reference to that in some way and perhaps play you guys a little bit of sound um, of us reacting to uh, attending that Miami game together. And stay tuned to the DBR Twitter account that's at DBRSBN because we'll be posting pictures. And uh, even if I can get some Periscope going, we might be able to do a little live feed from the meetup uh, for those of you who are out there. So again, if you're in the community and you are out there uh, and going to the game or just in the in the area on Saturday after the game, uh, stop by the JB Duke, say hello to us. We'd love to meet you. Uh, now to the preview of this game. Jason, you studied the Canes a bit what's going to be the key to beating this team in Cameron, a team that normally plays us tough, uh, but so far this year is having a terrible go of it. Boy, aren't they? I mean, this is a team that had high hopes coming into this season. They, they were one of those teams that were supposed to be sort of in the middle of the ACC and, and ha had a, you know, definitely had a chance to, to, to make the NCAA tournament. And uh, they've had a, a, a really, a really poor season. They're, they're currently 12 and 14, four and 10, in the ACC, um, but 
but they're a team that could be dangerous. I mean, look, we saw them. They played Carolina to overtime at Carolina. Um, they're a team. They 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 beat Clemson. Uh, I mean, they're a team. They they crushed Georgia Tech the other day. I mean, crushed Georgia Tech. And and again, you know, it's not that Georgia Tech is really good, but they're not bad. This Miami team is a team that's capable of playing really good basketball, uh, but but they've just they've struggled to put it all together a lot this year. And, and the thing I'm looking forward to in this game, people, we're going to get a chance to watch Chris Likes play basketball. If you are not familiar with Chris Likes, he's a sophomore. He is five foot seven inches tall. He's Sam's size. Sam, are you five seven? Uh, I might be someday. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Likes is Mighty Mouse. He is a tiny guy, but he is like uh, to say that he moves in in fast speed at a different gear than everyone else is an understatement. And I'm so looking forward to Trey Jones guarding Chris Likes. Likes went off against Carolina. He had a great game against UNC. He's had several games where he's really taken over things for them. They put the ball in his hands. He creates for other guys. He takes, you know, crazy off-balance shots sometimes, but they they find a way to go in. Uh, he, he's a heck of a player. And then the other two guys that are sort of interesting to talk about um, uh, are Zundu and Vasilovic. And, and Vasilovic is the one that I really, that I really think is worth highlighting. Um, uh, this is a guy who uh, is uh, just lately, he is raining three pointers down upon the ACC. Uh, he, he's a really nice outside shooting specimen. I think that's the only way you can put it. Um, and uh, I, if Duke is going to get in trouble in this game, it'll probably be because Chris Likes is creating opportunities and Vasilovich, Dijon Vasilovich from, uh, from, uh, from Australia, I believe he is. Um, is is the guy who's who's raining the threes down on Duke and and creating problems for us. He's he's turned into a a really really nice outside shooter and he's had a few games where he like against Georgia Tech the other day he had 21 points hit five of 11 threes against Clemson a few days before that he had 22 points hit five of 10 threes. This is a guy who's capable of of really going off um, and and he could be a a major factor for for Miami as as they I, I think it's the guards that are the way that Miami will try and win this game against Duke. It's a long shot for them. Like I said, they've, they've struggled this year, but likes and Vasilovich are the, are the way they're going to try and win. I think Donald, you, you watch Miami a lot too. What, what's your feeling on them? Yeah, I, I think you nailed it. I, I think the one thing about Miami and why they've struggled so much this year is that they can't, sometimes they just can't hit water from a boat. Like they, they don't shoot the ball. Well, they're not efficient on offense from beyond the arc, even with the last, you know, you know, four or five games with Vasilovich just going off. They don't shoot threes well, and that's really been their downfall. Is they they usually try to do one uh, and, and not the other, and they've had some games where, like, honestly, if you again we you go back to the blindfold theory, that they would still go zero for twenty um, with the blindfold. So I, I think when it comes to Miami, when we are on defense, we just got to force them to making terrible decisions with the basketball because uh, they like to do that, and sometimes they even allow teams. To, they'll do it for teams, even when teams don't want them to do it. Um, they they have played that way so far this season. That's why this season has been kind of the the chore that has been for the Hurricanes. But I think when it comes to us, if we can force them into making bad decisions and on offense, be efficient. I mean, we've been efficient in some of these games and really, you know, found key baskets. They're going to give us opportunities to get into the paint and and and, and also to have some open looks from outside. I'm not saying we have to go like 50% from outside the arc. It would be nice, but we don't have to do that. But if we're going to take outside shots, make sure that they're good shots because they're going to give us opportunities and lanes to have some good, make the good decision with the basketball. So as long as we're efficient on offense and we knuckle down on defense and force them into making some bad shots and careless decisions with the basketball, we'll, we'll have a pretty good time uh, on Saturday. This episode of the DBR podcast is brought to you by the fine gentlemen of Bird Campbell PA, a business law firm with offices in Florida and Texas, and is led by two Duke class of 1978 graduates, Tucker Bird and Jamie Campbell. If you or a loved one is in need of a firm with years of experience in business law in Florida or Texas, and you want to show some Blue Devil some love, consider the services of Bird Campbell. 
You can find them at birdcampbell.com. That's B-Y-R-D-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L.com. Okay, gentlemen, we end with our usual segments. First off, it's player of the week time, and I turn to you, Sam. Who you got? So I think there are two good choices this week. You've got R.J. Barrett and you've got Alex O'Connell. Uh, I'm going to go with with R.J. Barrett and his spectacular performance uh, over the weekend. He, um, along with O'Connell, I think was the key to victory against Syracuse, a game that Duke desperately needed to win to uh, stay you know, up to pace in the ACC race. So I'm going to give it to R.J. Barrett. Jason? Uh, while, while I want to tip my cap to Alex O'Connell... Um, against Syracuse, uh, O'Connell was not great against North Carolina. It's called Player of the Week because there are there is more than one game involved, and in both games, R.J. Barrett was ridiculously good. Um, shot at a high percentage, even though he was um, uh, even though he was the only option we had on offense for much of the time. Rebounded the ball really well. Created for his teammates. Dude averaged thirty one and a half points per game. I mean. <laughs> R.J. Barrett was the player of the week. Uh, I'm so glad you guys both mentioned R.J. Barrett so I can go ahead and agree with you. Um, in a week where the number one player in the country <laughs> goes down, the 1A player stepped up in a big way. He had two great games. Uh, hats off to Alex O'Connell for his performance against Syracuse. But like Jason said, it's, per, it's the player of the week. R.J. had a great week, and we're going to need more of that from him. So I'm going with him. And now we're going to go to parting shots. Jason, what do you have for us? So I want to go back to the shoe and I want to go back to Zion Williamson. And what I want to say is I am sick of hearing people talk about Zion Williamson shouldn't come, shouldn't play anymore for Duke. Zion Williamson should have been allowed to go to the pro straight out of high school. I mean, yeah, he should have, but let's dispense of the notion that Going to Duke wasn't an incredibly good thing for Zion Williamson. He has made tremendous amounts of money by coming to Duke. His shoe deal will now be probably twice what it would have been, maybe three times what it would have been. It is entirely possible that Zion Williamson is going to have a shoe deal that will only be rivaled by like maybe Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. I'm not sure there's going to be anyone else with a bigger shoe deal in the NBA because LeBron, Zion, LeBron James makes a fair amount. LeBron, oh, you're right. You got the lifetime. Him. Yeah. Him too. Him too. But, it, it, you know, my, my, my overall point is um, the shoe that Zion chooses to wear is going to be an unbelievable bidding war, the likes of which we've never heard before. The fact that Zion Williamson is a household name now is because he came to Duke because he played on national TV every single game. He will be on TV a hell of a lot more at Duke than he ever will in his first season in the NBA. Um, He will probably win more games his first season at Duke than he will his first season in the NBA. And I'm sick of the constant debate and discussion of whether Zion should shut it down. It's silly. He didn't have a contact injury. He would have possibly had that injury doing anything on the floor as he warmed up for you know, as he worked out with with trainers and as he worked out for teams and things like that, it's just it's just absurd. And uh, l- there's something good that these guys get out of coming to school. And Zion Williamson, while he's done wonderful things for Duke, Duke has done wonderful things for him. He's going to be the number one pick in the draft. He's going to be a household name. He's going to sign a huge shoe deal. These are things that would not have happened had he not come to Duke. I'm not not crediting him. He gets credit for turning himself into a national phenomenon. But part of why he's a national phenomenon is because he's wearing D-U-K-E across his chest. So can we please stop and dispense with this talk that Zion should shut it down. He shouldn't keep trying to play. How many championships is this guy going to win? How many ACC player of the years is he going to win? How many national player of the years is he going to win? He only gets to do those things if he keeps playing, if he comes to Duke and he keeps playing for Duke. Period. End of the story. So yeah, but Jason, Jason, how do you really feel though? <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, I want to touch on this a little bit because I, I'm glad you brought it up because there's been a, a lot of people talking about whether Zion should have, should 
to shut it down, like you said, or if he should have gone pro and, and, and all of this stuff, right? We heard this last year with Marvin Bagley when he had his eye injury. Um, and then he was out for a couple of games. They were like, he, he has demonstrated himself. He should shut it down, go pro and get your money, pal, get your money. I think in the end, people are really overlooking the fact that they are all talking about what Zion should do and what he shouldn't do. But what they aren't doing is saying Zion should do what Zion wants to do. And, and Zion picked Duke because he wants to come to Duke. He wants to play for Coach K. He wants to try and win a national championship with the other four guys that came into the class with him. He made that decision. He wants to do it. If anything, we should be saying, what does Zion want to do? If he is hurt, then let him rest. If he if he is able and willing to play, then let him play. But no one is actually talking about what he wants to do. And, we're, and, and the, here's the thing. We're talking about, it's not like we're talking about Hey, he had a massive injury that could have been avoided, and 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 someone ran into him that wouldn't have happened in the NBA. We're talking about a freak accident that would happen once in a trillion times, right? And it, it, we're talking about that as if it is the worst thing that has ever happened in the state. And only reason that it happened is that he was in college. That could have happened in the NBA. It has happened in the NBA. We've seen it plenty of times. Paul George himself. Didn't break through his shoe, but his shoes gave out on him and led to a gruesome leg injury that took him a year to overcome. Obviously, that could have happened to anybody. So I think people just need to dispense with the, with the you know, should he stay, should he go? Because really, it's only serving the person that they're talking, you know, that is talking. Uh, obviously, Nick fans want him to shut it down because they think he, they're going to get him with the number one pick. Duke fans want him to play because we have a chance to do something really great here in the month of March and early April. Zion just Look, needs I'm, to do what Zion needs to do. And, I'm sure and, you guys saw you guys saw him on the bench in that Syracuse game. He loves playing with these teammates. Yeah. He, he, he was, he was smiling and happy. By the way, I saw him jumping at times. Looked mm-hmm. like he was, you know, I, I saw him limping a little bit, but I also saw him jumping. This guy's gonna be back pretty soon. Um, I, it's silly. The notion that he should shut it down is silly. It's absurd. I guarantee He's not you. Shut it down. I guarantee you. He wants a crack at Carolina. I guarantee well, and, you. He wants that. And, and I, I for one, one hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> guarantee one, you. One other thing that I think is worth mentioning: if he was the kind of guy who didn't care about competition, didn't care about winning, and wanted to shut it down, so that he could, you know, oh no, I w- might get hurt. He would not be the kind of guy that teams would take number one. A guy who was that focused on himself, a guy who was that focused on protecting himself from maybe getting hurt, wouldn't rise up to be the kind of player that Zion Williamson is. The competitive drive, the, the, you know, the personal ambition, the desire to succeed and succeed as part of a team that makes him so great means that he's the kind of guy who wouldn't shut it down. And then the last thing I want to say about this really, really fast, um, Duke – has taken out a insurance policy on Zion and and on all these, you know, RJ has one as well. Cam has one as well. Duke has an insurance policy that Duke pays for that says for Zion and RJ and for Cam as well, I believe, if you suffer an injury playing for Duke or otherwise that causes your draft stock to drop out of the top 16, they determine that these guys are going to be top of the first round. If they suffer an injury, not if they play poorly or something like that, but they suffer an injury that causes them to not be drafted in the first 16 picks in the NBA draft, this policy pays them $8 million. Let's Hold be up. clear. Where? Wait, 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 wait. What? Is this true? You didn't know this? No. This, Donald, is, you... this is pretty standard. It's not like this is a once in a you know. I don't think we've ever thing. talked about this. This is yeah. standard for colleges to do that for, for big-time athletes. Sam, this has been reported all over the place this week. Dude. Dude, Duke has a policy. Zion Williamson, if the, if he gets hurt and doesn't get drafted in the first 16 picks, now let's be clear, Zion is, is going to earn a, a shit ton more than $8 million over his career. The moment he signs a shoe contract, he's going to earn many multiples of $8 million. But if worse came to worse, the terrible, terrible nightmare, awful scenario for Zion Williamson where injury ends his career before he even gets to the NBA draft, he gets eight mil. You can find a way to survive. You can live pretty nicely off of $8 million. There's no risk 
in this guy coming back and continuing to play. And I'm glad I could tell Sam about the $8 million contract. That, yeah, uh, I, I had I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've been well, studying too much for finals. That's what it is. That's, One last that, thing. That's what it is. One last thing. I, I, I recall a few years ago when Ben Simmons decided to shut it down before the uh, NBA draft that people were ragging him for not wanting to be with his team, LSU, um, and trying to get them to the NCAA tournament. I remember that distinctly, that he was just break through the coals for, for deciding to quit on his team. Uh, Michael Porter Jr. Was shut down for most of the year and then decided to try and come back at the end of the year. And people basically were like, yeah, this dude is great for trying to give it a run before the draft. And these guys, again, I mean, Ben Simmons was taken number one. Michael Porter Jr. was going to be number one before this entry. He slipped to like what five or six. And now with Zion, all of a sudden, it is the worst thing in the world for him to ever wear uh, the, the Duke shirt again. And I'm telling you, it's not people worried about what Zion's future is. It's about people saying, we don't want Duke to go as far as they could go with this guy in the lineup. That's pretty much, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, that, that I believe. That, it, I believe. that has that. everything, that, it won't say it has everything to do with it, but it has a lot to do with it. People, people, people trying to hate. Uh, and they don't want to see us succeed, and they know they w- that we have a chance of doing so with number one on the court. Uh, Sam, what is your parting shot? Oh, are we still doing? Uh, <laughs> We're still, still doing, doing party party? shots, fairly. Yeah, huh. I had no idea. Um, I uh, this morning I was scrolling through my Twitter feed and found a retweet of. Uh, some college basketball data visualization plots that were that were I don't know very nice looking, uh, very informative. Taught me about RJ Barrett's efficiency in the Syracuse game yesterday. And anyway, so I followed the account. It's called Fifth Fi- Fifth Factor Plots. I followed the account that was producing these these plots, and it turns out the guy who runs it and creates all these magnificent data visualization outputs is also a Duke graduate student. So uh, check out Fifth Factor Plots if I can say that again. Fifth factor plots they were uh it was pretty cool nice very cool yeah um, so no i have no hot takes i have no i'm not going to get incensed about anything i'm just going to keep <laughs> you know living my life and also learning about uh these these very cool insurance policies yeah um my parting shot is just going to be a simple thank you to everybody out there who has listened to one or all of the 150 episodes of this podcast that we have somehow put out over the last four plus years um, to make it to episode one. Hang on, hang on. Did you say a hundred and a hundred and fifty? One fifty. One. Wow. 50. Um, wow. to make it that far is would not be possible if it was not for each of you out there for listening. The emails we get from you guys, the shout outs on Twitter. If you know us in real life and, and you come up to talk to basketball, I think I can safely speak for, for Sam and Jason when I say that really motivates us to put out great content for you guys. And it keeps us going to talk about the school that we all love 150 episodes, an incredible achievement for any show or podcast. And I, I want to congratulate Sam and Jason as well for this achievement. It, it, all of this happened because we all had a, a combined effort to say, we want to see more Duke basketball content in the podcast arena. And there weren't, and at the time there really wasn't anything out there for us. So we decided to make it ourselves. Um, we, we only kept going really because uh, I think we've gone grown to like each other, and, and also because of you guys. Hey, out hey, there, hey, so. hey! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Speak for yourself. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> cool it, uh, man. I, I do like Sam's couch, which I will be sleeping on this weekend. <laughs> but uh, we'll, yeah, we'll we'll see. I think there's going to be a fight for for who's getting sleeping spots in my apartment. Um, Don, Donald, can... Donald, Donald called the couch. <laughs> I call the bed. That's what? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll deal with this all. We will time. reevaluate this later. But honestly, seriously, for for all of us out here, thank you guys out there for listening. Uh, hopefully, the next 150 episodes are just as fun as these first 100 were. 150 were. And and for Sam and Jason, thank you Wait, guys. And see for you on me Saturday on. night. And see you on Saturday night. And right see up. you on uh, see you on Saturday night uh, again. The JB Duke Hotel after the Miami game. We will be there. Um, we'll probably, we'll, we'll, we'll remind everybody, but just so you guys know, Saturday after the Miami game at the JB Duke hotel, come meet us. That's going to do it for episode 150. A big thank you to our sponsors, Bird Campbell and GTHC, GTH.com. Until then for Sam and Durham and Jason Atlanta, I am Donald coming to you from DC. Thanks for listening and Duke band. Take us home.